The same parts of the earth are not always moist or dry, but they change according as rivers come into existence and dry up. And so the relation of land to sea changes too, and the place does not always remain land or sea throughout all time. But where there was dry land, there comes to be sea, and where there is now sea, there one day comes to be dry land. But we must suppose these changes to follow some order and cycle. The principle and cause of these changes is that the interior of the earth grows and decays like the bodies of plants and animals. Only in the case of these latter, the process does not go on by parts, but each of them necessarily grows or decays as a whole, whereas it does go on by parts in the case of the earth. Here, the causes are cold and heat, which increase and diminish on account of the sun and its course. It is owing to them that the parts of the earth come to have a different character, that some parts remain moist for a certain time and then dry up and grow old, while other parts in their turn are filled with life and moisture. Now when places become drier, the springs necessarily give out, and when this happens, the rivers first decrease in size and then finally become dry. And when rivers change and disappear in one part and come into existence correspondingly in another, the sea must needs be affected. If the sea was once pushed out by rivers and encroached upon the land anywhere, it necessarily leaves that place dry when it recedes. Again, if the dry land has encroached on the sea at all by a process of silting set up by the rivers when at their full, the time must come when this place will be flooded again. But the whole vital process of the earth takes place so gradually and in periods of time which are so immense compared with the length of our life that these changes are not observed and before their course can be recorded from beginning to end, whole nations perish and are destroyed. Of such destructions, the most utter and sudden are due to wars, but pestilence or famine cause them too. Famines, again, are either sudden and severe or else gradual. In the latter case, the disappearance of a nation is not noticed because some leave the country while others remain, and this goes on until the land is unable to maintain any inhabitants at all. So a long period of time is likely to elapse from the per first departure to the last, and no one remembers in the lapse of time destroys all record even before the last inhabitants have disappeared. In the same way, a nation must be supposed to lose account of the time when it first settled in a land that was changing from a marshy and watery state and becoming dry. Here too, the change is gradual and lasts a long time, and men do not remember who came first, or when, or what the land was like when they came. This has been the case with Egypt. Here it is obvious that the land is continually getting drier, and that the whole country is a deposit of the river Nile. But because the neighboring people settled in the land gradually as the marshes dried, the lapse of time has hidden the beginning of the process. However, all the mouths of the Nile, with a single exception of that of Canopus, are obviously artificial and not natural. And Egypt was nothing more than what is called Thebes, as Homer, too, shows, modern though he is in relation to such changes. For Thebes is the place that he mentions, which implies that Memphis did not yet exist, or at any rate, was not as important as it is now. That this should be so is natural, since the lower land came to be inhabited later than that which lay higher. For the parts that lie nearer to the place where the river is depositing the silt are necessarily marshy for a longer time, since the water always lies most in the newly formed land. But in time this land changes its character, and in turn enjoys a period of prosperity. For these places dry up and come to be in good condition, while the places that were formerly well-tempered someday grow excessively dry and deteriorate. This happened to the land of Argos and Mycenae in Greece. In the time of the Trojan Wars, the Argive land was marshy and could only support a small population, whereas the land of Mycenae was in good condition, and for this reason Mycenae was the superior. But now the opposite is the case, for the reason we have mentioned. The land of Mycenae has become a completely dry and barren, while the Argive land that was formerly barren only to the water has now become fruitful. Now the same process that has taken place in this small district must be supposed to be going on over whole countries and on a large scale. 
Men whose outlook is narrow suppose the cause of such events to be change in the universe, in the sense of a coming to be of the world as a whole. Hence they say that the sea being dried up and is growing less, because this was observed to have happened in more places now than formerly. But this is only partially true. It is true that many places are now dry, that formerly were covered with water. But the opposite is true now, for if they look, they will find that there are many places where the sea has invaded the land. But we must not suppose that the cause of this is that the world is in process of becoming. For it is absurd to make the universe to be in process because of small and trifling changes, when the bulk and size of the earth are surely as nothing in comparison with the whole world. Rather, we must take the cause of all these changes to be that, just as winter occurs in the seasons of the year, so in determined periods there comes a greater winter of a great year and with it excess of rain. But this excess does not always occur in the same place. The deluge in the time of Deucalion, for instance, took place chiefly in the Greek world, and in it especially about ancient Hellas, the country about the Dona and the Achelous, a river which has often changed its course. Here the Selai dwelt and those who were formerly called Grisi and now Hellenes. When, therefore, such an excess of rain occurs, we must suppose that it suffices for a long time. We have seen that some say that the size of the subterranean cavities is what makes some rivers perennial and others not, whereas we maintain that the size of the mountains is the cause, and their density and coldness. For great, dense, and cold mountains catch and keep and create most water, whereas if the mountains that overhang the sources of rivers are small or porous and stony and clayey, these rivers run dry earlier. We must recognize the same kind of thing in this case too. Where such abundance of rain falls in the great winter, it tends to make the moisture of these places almost everlasting. But as time goes on, places of the latter type dry up more, while those of the former, moist type, do so less, until at last the beginning of the same cycle returns. Since there is necessarily some change in the whole world, but not in the way of coming into existence or perishing, for the universe is permanent, it must be, as we say, that the same places are not forever moist through the presence of sea and rivers, nor forever dry. And the facts prove this. The whole land of the Egyptians, whom we take to be the most ancient of men, has evidently gradually come into existence and been produced by the river. This is clear from an observation of the country, and the facts about the Red Sea suffice to prove it too. One of their kings tried to make a canal to it, for it would have been of no little advantage to them for the whole region to have become navigable. Sesostris is said to have been the first of the ancient kings to try. But he found that the sea was higher than the land. So he first, and Darius afterwards, stopped making the canal, lest the sea should mix with the river water and spoil it. So it is clear that all this part was once unbroken sea. For the same reason Libya, the country of Ammon, is, strangely enough, lower and hollower than the land to the seaward of it. For it is clear that a barrier of silt was formed and after it lakes and dry land, but in course of time the water that was left behind in the lakes dried up and is now all gone. Again, the silting up of the lake Maeotis by the rivers has advanced so much that the limit of the size of the ships which can now sail into it to trade is much lower than it was 60 years ago. Hence, it is easy to infer that it too, like most lakes, was originally produced by the rivers, and that it must end by drying up entirely. Again, this process of silting up causes a continuous current through the Bosporus, and in this case we can directly observe the nature of the process. Whenever the current from the Asiatic shore threw up a sandbank, there first formed a small lake behind it. Later, it dried up and a second sandbank formed in front of the first and the second lake. This process went on uniformly and without interruption. Now when this has been repeated often enough, in the course of time the strait must become like a river, and in the end the river itself must dry up. So it is clear, since there will be no, time, no end to time and the world is eternal, that neither the Tanais nor the Nile has always been flowing, but that the region whence they flow was once dry, for their effect may be fulfilled, but time cannot. And this will be equally true of all other rivers. But if rivers come into existence and perish, and the same parts of the earth were not always moist, the sea must needs change correspondingly. And if the sea is always advancing in one place and receding in another, it is clear that the same parts of the whole earth are not always either sea or land, but that all this changes in course of time. 
So we have explained that the same parts of the earth are not always land or sea and why that is so, and also why some rivers are perennial and others not.